Morning, guys, or good afternoon. It's Dave Burroughs, Chief Strategist here at Barometer Capital Management. I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Uh, lots to talk about, uh, so we'll we'll move right along. <clears throat> We've talked quite a while now about the fact that risk assets in the market in general have been improving. This is in sort of a stark contrast to those who are concerned about prospects for a deep recession. Uh, I think that market may be telling us we are not headed for a deep recession. Certainly, we've discounted uh, a shallow recession, uh, and we're going to find out a lot more as we go through earnings in this upcoming period. Uh, of course, we've been dealing with a Fed cycle that has been uh, a, a particularly strenuous one, uh, where credit conditions have tightened quite substantially. But <clears throat> a lot of the risk indicators that we look at continue to improve, uh, pointing to the fact that perhaps last October was a, a low, a cyclical low uh, in a secular bull market. So let's just start from the top and, and look at some pictures and, and see what we see. We talked quite a long time about the fact that during a structural bull market, you tend to stay above a rising 200 week moving average. Uh, it certainly has been the case. We got there in October. Uh, we've traded above it ever since. And then we're sitting actually not all that far from the highs. Uh, leading into the, the bear market that started in December of 2021. We talked uh, uh, a lot about seasonality along the way. We noted that the end of June tends to be a little bit sloppy, but the beginning of July tends to be a little bit better. And when we look at the S&P, you know, we just see a very clear process that we've been going through, and it certainly hasn't been easy. There's certainly been lots of ups and downs. There's certainly been lots of bouts of, you know, good news and bad news. You know, employment has been uh, very, very resilient. Uh, inflation, though, has been high. Uh, and we've, you know, basically churned back and forth. We started the bottoming process in October. We made a higher low in December. We rallied. We made a higher low in March. We made a higher low at the end of April, beginning of May. And, of course, here we are having taken out the highs from last summer and trading very close to recent highs. So we're, we're about 1% off the highs. But you, know, you can see that the moving averages went from basically all trending lower to all trending higher. That's the 200-day, the 150-day, the 50-day moving average, the 21-day moving average, and the 9-day moving average. We've been above those now for several weeks as they work their way higher. And the technical picture continues to improve. Now, we've talked about the fact that a lot of what the gains in the S&P have been driven by a very small number of stocks, the big, biggest 10 stocks have accounted for over 80% of the return in the S&P this year. But in the last couple of weeks, things started to get better. Now, the NASDAQ 100, of course, dominated by the same stocks, uh, trading, again, near highs, but has been consolidating now over about the last two, two and a half weeks. And in fact, the equally weighted S&P has been doing a little bit better, and that's a welcome change. That means that the breadth of the advance has been getting more significant. When we look at the Dow Industrial Average, it's certainly been improving too, although it looks a lot different than the NASDAQ, up 3% so far year to date. Uh, and so a little lagging, certainly, uh, but some stocks in the group actually acting very, very well. The TSX, uh, again, lagging up about 2.5% on the year. I think a lot of people who own uh, Canadian equity portfolios are frustrated. It tends to be, though, that um, the, the Canadian market does better as it becomes clear that we are into the next economic cycle or looking out at the next economic cycle because it's a more cyclical index. But again, things have been getting better. And there's the Russell 2000. And the Russell 2000, again, a series of bottoming uh, attempts. And you can see that in the last week, we've moved uh, basically to the highest we've been at since, since uh, February. Now, outside of the US, lots of stock markets doing well. We know over the last 12 months, Global markets generally outperforming the U.S. market. The Nikkei has broken out of a base going all the way back to 1991 and has moved sharply higher. Uh, India uh, making multi-year highs. Mexico making multi-year highs. So equities as an asset class, just to make it really simple, <clears throat> is a broadening asset class. More geographic participation, more sectoral participation, more market caps participating. That's a market that's healing. Now, when it comes to fixed income, you know, it's a tricky picture. We've been through 40 years of declining rates that put in a punctuation point bottom in 2020, a lot like the bottom we saw in the late 1940s. Uh, and you've seen 
long-term rates and short-term rates alike moving higher. This is the 10-year yield breaking above all of the moving averages. You've seen them all slowly make a turn to higher. Uh, we held here for many, many months. And in the last three months, yields moving higher again. In the last week, we've been above 4%. Um, for the first time going back to fall of 2022. We know that the positioning is very, very crowded in the bond market. And we know that because people have looked for defensive places to hide in the event the economy got worse. The problem is when the crowd gets there, often it's too late. And we know that in March of 2009, at the end of the financial crisis, people got crowded in the bond market looking for safety. And it was not the right move. It was not the consensus that got it right. It was those that went the other way. And similarly, we pointed out in May, this is the most crowded bonds have been since then. And what's happened? May, June, July, markets working its way higher and bond prices working their way lower. This is the aggregate bond index. No change here. The moving average for prices of bonds are moving sharply lower. In fact, year to date, <clears throat> you know, the bond market is down. And we're down on long-term bonds, we're down on mid-term bonds, <clears throat> you know, down by various issuers, uh, uh, corporate bonds, uh, uh, high yield bonds actually doing a little bit better. Um, and this is the TLT. So TLT is down 3.6% year to date. That's after being down 43% leading into the end of last year. So we continue to think that bonds are in a bear market. They do not pose a great risk reward for investors, especially given the fact that we have inflation and we certainly pay taxes on interest. So stocks relative to bonds, the S&P relative to the aggregate bond index has re-accelerated upwards. That means stocks are relatively outperforming bonds and it has been so fairly consistently. And that's an important concept. When you go back and look at what happened when rates bottomed in the late 1940s and then worked their way higher from 1951 through 1981, 30 years, people have this view that stocks can't do well with rising rates. Now, people got very complacent when rates were falling, having a big component of bonds in their portfolio. And the reason was that stocks versus bonds had a similar return. And we don't have the slides I was looking for. The point I would like to make is that from 1951 to 1966, stocks went up on average a little over 10% a year, and bonds generated a positive return of about 1.6. Now, if you strip out the 1.5% in inflation, it was basically a break even over 15 years for bond investors, while stock investors had a significant positive. Uh, inflation adjusted return. So we need things that will help us to generate returns in an inflationary world. And we're going to get an important CPI number this week. The expectation is it will have come down. Used car prices moved down last month. Most they've moved down uh, since the beginning of COVID. That's a positive. That's been quite inflationary. We know rents have been getting a little bit better. Food prices a little bit better. Input costs for manufacturing a little bit better that can help the Fed take their foot off the brake and at least maybe not do much more by way of interest rate increases. Um, <clears throat> in commodities, commodities may be sniffing that out. While rates have been rising after a very, very sharp rally in commodities from 2020 through 2022, they've consolidated. And we've talked about the fact that we're in a tight consolidation range, threatening to come out to the upside. Now the market, will sniff out when the Fed is getting close to done and will start to buy more inflation or riskier assets. And this is what we've seen. This is the DBC broad-based commodities ETF. This is the consolidation that has been through now over the last many months. And we are hooking up and out of that range. Now that's important, two things. First of all, Investors are sniffing out the fact that we may not be headed for a hard landing. Investors are sniffing out that there may be more stimulus in China. It may be that there are less restrictive monetary policies in the world. Agriculture was the first of the commodity groups 
to come out to the upside out of its consolidation range. Uranium, we talked about a couple of weeks ago, has done that. We saw lithium come out over the course of the last two weeks. And now oil is coming out. This is the DBO, which tracks crude prices in the US, crude prices in Europe also improving. And there's just a whole number of these technical price patterns that speak to the fact that the wrestling match between buyers and sellers is resolving in favor of the buyers. And that's going to be difficult because a lot of people are sitting on the sidelines. Our view is our job is to invest and be prepared to generate a return over the course of the next economic cycle. Not to lose a little bit less while the market's wrestling, it's to be positioned to take advantage of what's coming next. Now we know after years of poor performance in energy companies, that there has been a lack of spending on, on drilling, a lack of spending on services, a lack of spending on capacity. When we look at the inventory drawdowns that have been taking place this past week, we averaged about a million dollar million barrels a day out of inventory. When you compare that to what is seasonally typical over the last seven years or eight years, you can see that the drawdown is much sharper and that we may be headed to much greater drawdowns as the uh, US is stopping selling oil out of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. When you then look at the percentile or how much money of wealth management assets have been invested in energy, it's less than 5% of a full allocation. So people are as underinvested in energy as they have been in years. At a time when inventories are dropping and there's not been new capital investment. So our view is likely that's probably positive. The other thing giving us pause and giving us cause to believe the Fed may be getting closer to done is that the US dollar, which peaked as a safety asset in October, has made a series of lower highs against the basket of world currencies like the pound and the euro and the yen, and of course our Canadian dollar. And here we are now making a multi-month low, and there's one last line of defense in the sand before you see US dollar moving lower in another step. Again, this points to strength in commodity prices. It, it points to strength in risk-oriented assets. It points to strength in global markets. And it points to less and less concern about the immediate future. So as I always say, we are not gonna invest everywhere. Our job is to try to identify the right neighborhoods and the right asset classes and sectors and themes. We think the equity asset class gives great risk reward and is something that can help us in an inflationary world. We think commodity prices and commodity exposure is something that can give us help in an inflationary world. From a sector perspective, there's a number of sectors that do well early in the next cycle. And so we should be seeing some evidence that they are participating in this rally and then we have to find some great securities to express our view. So when we're looking at sectors, we're trying to find groups that are seeing expanding breadth where more and more securities within the group are participating in a rally. That's money getting put to work. And we really want to avoid those areas that are seeing deterioration of breadth where money's leaving. Maybe they've become crowded. Maybe the situation is changing. And maybe now the flows will be out giving a poor risk reward. So let's just talk about that a little bit. As we sit, our long-term indicators are solidly positive. The percent of stocks and uptrends has been improving in the US and globally. Percent of stocks trading above the 50-day moving average has steadily been improving. Percent of stocks over the 150-day moving average has been improving. Now in the last week, we had a little bit of loss of momentum in some of the tech names. We'll watch that closely, but that's a secondary indicator. When we look at leadership, as of the end of May, the average sector had 35% of stocks and uptrends. And you can see many sectors in small letters, meaning that the breadth had been falling. Let's look at what things look like today. It's a very different picture. Almost 44% of stocks are in uptrends. 10% more on average by sector 
are participating in a rally. A very small number of sectors have deteriorating breadth, and they include drugs, utilities, gas utilities, consumer staples, defensive sectors. So breadth is narrowing in the sectors you would expect to do well if we're heading into recession. On the other hand, the sectors that have been improving the most, oil, oil service, transports, Wall Street, that's investment banks, steel producers, machinery, builders, aerospace. These are cyclical sectors. These are sectors that you would want to own if you believe we're headed toward the next economic cycle. Let's look at group performance over the last month. Strongest group in the market over the last 30 days, industrials, followed by consumer discretionary materials, Infotech up three and a half percent. We go to the other end of the spectrum, worst, per, worst participating sectors, utilities, healthcare, consumer staples. So these are the most expensive parts of the market. They are the most crowded parts of the market and they are the ones that are now underperforming. On the other end of the spectrum, the contrary sectors, the ones you wouldn't want to own if you thought we were headed off a cliff. Industrials, consumer discretionary materials, acting better than anything else. Our job is to understand the message of the market and make sure our, our portfolios reflect that. Now we've talked over the last few weeks about the fact that relative strength in technology has been improving. And now since the end of May, it's been basically sideways or equal with the market but it's been a very strong positive trend led by the largest companies, Microsoft, Apple, Nvidia, Broadcom, Adobe, Cisco, and so on. In that group, we have lots of exposure. About 21% of firm assets are in technology related companies focused on things like artificial intelligence, infrastructure, computer chips like Nvidia's, uh, AMD, which uh, is also computer chips, Oracle, which has an Oracle cloud, AI products, digital advertising, e-commerce, and cybersecurity. So we're rep well represented here, but we think these groups may be a little bit crowded. Diversified industrials, this is an equally weighted basket of industrial companies, the VIS ETF, each company making up about 3% of the ETF is making new 52 week highs and has had an especially strong period since the beginning of June. Again, going against the grain of the chorus of people looking for a sharp recession. Now, maybe the market's got it dead wrong. The signaling isn't that way. Construction machinery relative to the S&P 500 has been sharply improving since the beginning of June and making new relative highs. Aerospace and defense pushing on a 52 week high. Now, there's a hot war going on. So it makes sense that defense stocks should be doing relatively well. But if we're headed to a recession, transport should not. This is the XTN ETF making new 52 week highs. We haven't seen these prices since April of 2022 and moving sharply higher, really, since the beginning of June. Now, this includes the airlines, which have been performing particularly well. Air Canada is one of our bigger positions. But the rails also performing well, and some of the trucking companies performing well. Now, whether we think that think of them as industrial or think of them as consumer, the home builders and home building construction materials companies also have been on a tear. Up 2.3% since the beginning of the bear market. In other words, recovered all of the losses while the market is fiddling, trying to decide if we're headed into recession. The materials producers, the FXZ ETF, made up of companies that make everything from steel to cement to, uh, to copper, again, moving sharply higher since the beginning of June. We've made a series of higher lows. And when we look at it on a longer term basis, up 7.8, 7.9% 7 since the beginning of the year, performing well. And that's companies like Cameco, which we talked about a couple of weeks ago, trading better than 86% of companies in the S&P over the last 12 months. Vulcan Materials, which we talked about adding about four weeks ago, five weeks ago, after making a new five-year high. The Steel ETF, very close to 52-week highs. And when we look across this group, 
the defense stocks, advanced manufacturing, transportation, and metals and aggregates. Companies like Freeport, McMoran, Cameco, Tech Resources, Vulcan Materials, all performing well over the last two weeks. Now, <clears throat> in the energy space, we talked about the fact that the natural gas producers, after breaking out to new highs in 2022, spent the last 12 months in a narrowing range of saw between buyers and sellers. We thought that perhaps the commodities might start to reemerge because this group started to move up and out of its range. Oil service over the last month has really taken off. One of the newer positions that we put on recently is Schlumberger, which certainly has had a great two weeks uh, and is trading very close to 52 week highs. The reason we bought Schlumberger, it's a global company. They are specifically in international markets. They are dominant in the Middle East and in Africa and in South America. And we know that energy companies are going to have to spend a fair bit of money if they want to bring on capacity that they're losing as the shale gas and shale oil companies are losing some of the pressure in their wells. And then in the last week, the XOP, which is oil and, oil and gas producers, also broke out of a range to the upside. And we think that this is important because, as I mentioned earlier, investors are way underinvested in energy. I understand the ESG issues, but I also understand it's going to be 20 or 25 years that we're going to continue to need energy because consumption of gasoline and carbon products around the world continues to grow whether in the developing world we're trying to get off them or not, this is going to be an, a global issue. So we have all kinds of exposure here across the group in, in Canada uh, and globally. And we think that these go really, really well for the second half of the year. So some key themes that we want to keep in mind. Consumer discretionary companies relative to consumer staples or offense versus defense Offense is making gains. Uber is another company that we've added in the consumer space recently. Uber stood out because it is now just about to turn cash flow positive in the next couple of quarters, earnings positive for the first time. They have a dominant position globally. I just came back. I was in London last week and had an opportunity to visit Wimbledon. And whether it was a river taxi or a um, rented bike, or a rented scooter, or a black car, or an UberX, they really dominate the marketplace there as they do in many, many places around the world. But this is a company that had, has global reach, they've cut costs, uh, and it's just an ever-expanding market for them, and they really have <clears throat> taken the share from Lyft, which was their main competitor. Financials. Now, we've talked about financials over the last few months because we know that in uh, April, it was a very tough month for the regional banks and the large banks alike. We also noted the fact that after breaking out in 2021, there has been caution in the, in the financials <clears throat> around the rate hike cycle and around cause for concern around a recession. I do note, however, that JP Morgan has recently broken out to new highs. This is one of the biggest positions in the firm and the leader generally goes first. So Fairfax has been performing well in the insurance companies. Uh, uh, IA Financial has been performing here in Canada. Certainly in the US, the property casualty group have been performing well, and the largest, highest quality banks also performing well. So these groups all are behaving the way that we would wanna see them behave if we are in the right spots. Our job isn't to make sure we maximize the first three or four months off the bottom. It's to make sure that we have sectors and themes that will lead over the course of the cycle. We think that the runway for technology and AI is tremendous. But we also think EV is a very important theme and it's going to require all kinds of materials. Infrastructure spending is going to require all kinds of materials. There's a shortage of housing. We need more homes. The home builders are, have an opportunity to fulfill some of, those, some of those demands. We know that the banks ultimately benefit from rising rates because as mortgages reset, their spreads widen. 
And we know if the market starts to sniff out that things could get better, the defensive sectors like consumer staples and utilities are highly likely to underperform, and they are. When I went through the list of relative strength new lows today, ETFs that are making new lows relative to the S&P, this is the list. And it's dominated by healthcare, consumer staples, pharmaceuticals, bonds, uh, food and beverage, high dividend payers. These are all bond proxies. And on the other side, we know that there is relative strength new highs and things like transports relative to utilities, dividend growth relative to high dividend payers. So I think we're in the right spots. This is high beta or economically sensitive versus low volatility, most defensive. So our positioning really hasn't changed very much. We continue to have a sizable weight in information technology, an overweight in financials, industrials, energy, consumer discretionary, and health sorry, and uh, materials, an underweight in healthcare, communication services, consumer staples, real estate, and utilities. From a currency perspective, Canadian dollar. After a year and a half of a bottoming process versus US dollar, we believe has resolved, resolved higher. So as a result, in our pooled accounts, we're hedging back to Canadian dollars. In our separately managed accounts, we are being conscious of how much US exposure we have, especially given the fact that other markets other than the US are performing well. From a volatility perspective, volatility remains very low. And when we look at credit spreads, credit spreads look benign. In other words, no major concerns about credit risk. So seasonally, we're in a decent period. We know that August and September will come and there's always challenges. We know that the earnings period is in front of us and we're gonna have more information over the next three to four weeks. But we really believe that we are in a structural bull market that has gone on for 125 months. The last structural bull market went on 220 months, which means we could have 80 to 120 months in front of us of significant gains. We know that when we go through one of these cyclical bear markets, what comes on the other side is a long run up in prices. And our job is to be positioned for that. Would we love to have said we are all technology on January the 1st, guessing that after a 30% decline, that would be the one group that would take off? Well, we'd love to say that, but we're not there. We think that we have to have a diversified approach. We're focused in general on dividend growth and early cyclical sectors, which clearly are starting to perform well. So we look forward to the back half of the year. And should anything change, we're certainly happy to get more defensive, but as it sits, our risk models are firmly positive and things look as though they would continue to improve. So with that, uh, I don't have a moderator today, but I will take a look and see if I have any questions. Uh, we got lots of people on the line. So uh, let's, let's see if there's any questions. Shocking, we got no questions. Well, everybody's shy today. Um, if you've got questions you don't want to ask online, please give us a call. Uh, happy to jump on the phone, happy to respond to an email. Uh, if you've got something you want to ask your counselor about, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. And if you're not a client and would like to be, uh, we'll be very happy to speak to you. Well, yeah, we look forward to the next next uh, number of months and, uh, and uh, we'll see whether things continue to unfold as they are. Thanks so much, everybody.